Machine learning problems can be subdivided into either classification or regression problems. Classification is where we are attempting to predict a categorical variable, such as fascias, and regression is where we're trying to predict a continuous output, such as a well log measurement. If you want to see how to use a popular machine learning algorithm to predict well log measurements, then I'm sure you will enjoy today's video. Hey friends, I'm Andy, and if you already knew that, then welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we're going to look at the random forest algorithm, which is a very popular and easy to understand algorithm for machine learning. And we're going to see how we can apply it to predicting well log measurements. In one of my earlier videos, we looked at how to use the algorithm to predict fascias from our well log measurements. So be sure to check that out if you want to see the basics behind the algorithm. The major difference between classification and regression with random forest is that we're predicting a numeric output rather than a class-based output. And then when the individual trees are bagged together, we then average the prediction from each of those trees to make our final prediction. Also in today's video, we're going to see how we can split our data up into our training, testing and validation data sets and how we can use them to verify our model. So let's go over to our Jupyter Notebook and see how we can apply that algorithm. The first step of this tutorial is to import the libraries that we're going to be working with. In this example, we're going to be using a combination of pandas for loading and storing our data and matplotlib for visualizing our data. We will import scikit-learn later on in the tutorial. We're going to import our data from a CSV file using the pd.read underscore CSV function from pandas. Within this function, we will pass in our file path and also the columns that we will be using. As long as the CSV file contains headings for each column, we can use this use calls parameter. So here I'm going to be calling upon well, depth, row B, GR, NFI, PEF, and DT. Don't worry if you're not too familiar with these mnemonics, as the techniques applied within this tutorial can be, can be used for any other data set. So if we load that in, and then we go and start creating our training, testing, and validation data sets. The first thing we need to do is understand how many wells are within our data set. So we should have four of them, and when we call upon the dot unique function, we get back a list of each of the wells within the data set. And we're going to use these wells to segregate our data set into a training data set and a testing data set. So the testing data set is going to be the data set that will be set aside to test our final model on unseen data. And this allows us to understand how well our model generalizes to new data. The training wells, we've got three here, uh, F11B, F11A and F1A. So we're going to use these to build a random forest regressor model. So now that we've created this, the list of the well names, we need to then extract that data from the main data frame, the DF variable that we created earlier. And we can do this very simply by calling upon these two lines here. So we've got a training and validation data. So our validation data will be used to help tune the model and validate how well our model is performing. And then the test data, as mentioned, that will be set aside for blind testing. So to extract the data from the main data frame, we just use the list that we created and then, and then we check if the well within this particular well column is within that list. If so, then it copy it to a new data frame. And same with the test data. Once we've run that, we can then view the statistics of each of these and we can see that we've got the same curves or the same features within both of these data sets. So we can see from the statistical summary that we have varying levels of counts for each of the columns. We have DT, which is about 4,000 values here, compared to GR, which has about 32,500. And the same with our training data set, we can see that we've 116, 117,000 values here, whereas our DT only has 21,000. So we can deal with the missing values in a number of ways. And the simplest way is to actually just drop the values. Now this does reduce the amount of data available for training and testing. However, it is a very simple and quick way to deal with it. When evaluating missing values within your data set, you should try to understand why you have missing values and what impacts they have on, on removing them from the data set. So as mentioned for this example, I'm just going to drop them and we can call upon train underscore val a df and then we call upon drop na and then we say in place is equal to true. And we repeat again with the test data set, test underscore df dot drop na in place is equal to true. 
And if we call upon train val underscore df dot describe and view the values that we get back, we can see that we've reduced our training data set from 117,000 values down to 21,000. And we can see each of the columns is the same length or has the same number of values within them. So now that we've prepared our data and removed the missing values, we can now move on to building a random forest regression model. So to do this, we need to import a few modules from the scikit-learn library. First, we're going to import train test split, then metrics, and then a random forest regressor. We then need to select our training and target features. So these are commonly set to X and Y. So we've got X, which is going to be train underscore val df. And then we use the square brackets to select our columns from the data frame. So in this case, I'm going to select row B, GR, NFI, and PEF. So we're only using four curves from our data set to train the model. And our target feature is going to be DT, which is our acoustic compressional slowness. And then we just need to extract that from the train val underscore df. And if we want, we can just double check that we've got these values extracted properly. So if I call upon X, we can see that we've got 21,000 rows here. So now we need to separate our data into our training and our validation data. Now, one thing to bear in mind is that within the data science community, there is a little bit of a mixing of the terms of validation and testing. In this example, I'm going to be calling the data set that we're going to be using for tuning our model and how well our model has performed. And that will be known as the validation data set. Now we've got our test data set, which is set aside and not seen in this process at all until we apply the final model. So we need to create some variables uh, for our training and validation data set. So we just call upon x underscore train, x underscore val for validation, and we call upon y underscore train, and then y underscore val, and we will set that equal to train test split, and we pass in our x variable, which is our features here, row b, gr, and phi, and pef, and then we pass in our y variable, which is our target feature. We then need to decide on the test size and we can call upon an R, a parameter called test size and set that to 0 0.2, which means that 20% of the data is going to be used for the validation data set and the remaining 80 is going to be used for training the model. So to set up a regression model, we first need to create a variable called reg r, which is just an abbreviation for regression. And we set that equal to random forest regressor. So next we need to fit it to our data and we just call upon reg r dot fit and then pass in our x underscore train and our y underscore train. So now we're going to fit that model to our training data set. So now that we've got our random forest regressor trained, we can then apply a prediction. So if I do y underscore pred, which is going to be our predicted y variable and set that equal to regger dot predict and then we pass in x underscore val, which is our validation data set, and then run that. So it's just run, we've not got any output from this, so we just want to check the results now, and this is where the metrics come in. So the first one we're going to call upon is metrics.mean absolute error, and then we pass in y underscore val for our validation and then our prediction, and then when we run that, we get back a value of about 1.62. So this tells us about the average absolute error between the actual measurement yval and the predicted measurement ypred. And this is measured in the same units as the target feature. In this case, it's going to be microseconds per foot. So another metric that we can call upon is the root mean square error. And this is another commonly used metric to evaluate the performance of a machine learning model. So to calculate this, we first need to create a variable called MSE, which is the mean square error. And we set that equal to metrics dot mean squared error, pass in y underscore val and y underscore pred. And then to get the root mean square error, we need to raise it to the power of 0 0.5 to take the square root. And then we call upon our MSE and we get back a value of about 2.936. So simple metrics like mean absolute error and mean square error or root mean square error are ni a nice way to see how a model is performed. 
But one thing that you should always do is actually check the data itself. And one way to do this is to use a scatter plot with the validation on the x-axis and the predicted data on the y-axis. So here I've got a simple scatter plot set up through matplotlib where I'm taking my validation data and my predicted data and then plotting it on a scatter plot. If we run that, we get back our scatter plot and we also have a one-to-one -one relationship line in black here, which is set up by this line here, plt.plot. So what we get back is this plot, which indicates that we have a reasonably good prediction. There are a few points, such as these ones here, between 60 and 80 microseconds per foot, that appear to be over-predicted. And then similarly over here in the 100 to 120 range, we can see that we've got some values that are under-predicted relative to the actual value. So ideally at this stage we should go back to our data or model and see if we can improve this prediction. And this may involve changing the inputs or change, checking for outliers and possibly gathering more data. So assuming that we've gone back and done that, we can then move on to testing how well our model performs on unseen data. So as before, I'm going to create the x variable or the, for the uh, test well, and that is going to be using row B, GR, NFI, and PEF, same as before. And then I'm just going to make a direct prediction into the actual test data frame. It will be called test underscore DT. And this is set to regr.predict, and then we pass in our x values that we've seen here in this previous cell. So again, we can repeat what we've just done with the scatter plot. So we can run this and then see how we've performed. And what we get back is the same scatter plot as above. And we can see that up here in this interval, around about 120 microseconds per foot, our model is not performing very well. And we can see that we've got quite a wide spread around this middle part here, around 80 to 90 microseconds per foot. We've also got a patch here that is over predicting at about 60 microseconds per foot. So this tells us that our model could be improved significantly to try and reduce some of that error. Now we may not understand where this error is and one way we can do that is to plot a log plot or a line plot of our true data versus predicted. And those that are petrophysicists will recognize this sort of plot where we've got depth along the x-axis and we've got our uh, measurement along the y-axis here. So at the moment we don't know which curve represents which and we can easily add in a label argument here which is going to be our actual dt and we do the same with this one here which is our predicted data and we'll set label is equal to predicted dt and we call upon plt.legend to plot our legend on the plot. So we can see that we've got our prediction in orange and our actual measurement in blue. As we go down through the well, we can see that we've got a bit of under prediction here at this shallower interval. And then we get to this uh, slower interval in terms of acoustic compressional slowness, where the actual measurement is reading, reading about 120 microseconds per foot. However, the, the prediction is not reaching those values. And we can go further along and we can see that we've got a reasonably good match uh, as we go through this interval here. However, as we start to move further down the, the well, we can see that we are over predicting DT. And that is mo more noticeable as we get towards the end of this well. We can see here that we've got the blue is reading around about 70 microseconds per foot, reaching about 80. Uh, whereas our predicted DT is actually reading a bit higher and is a bit noisier. And there we have it, we've seen how to use the random forest algorithm to make predictions on our well log measurements. If you've enjoyed today's video, give it a thumbs up down below. And if you want to see more content from this channel, click on that subscribe button and ding that notification bell. So thanks for watching, and until next time, bye for now.